The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled TROP2 Targeting Antibody Drug Conjugates as New Tools in the Triple Negative Breast Cancer and Hormone Receptor Positive, HER2 Negative Breast Cancer Treatment Arsenal, Advancing Patient-Centered Care to Make the Most of Modern Targeted Treatments. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZDH860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this satellite symposium, TROP2 Targeting Antibody Drug Conjugates as New Tools for the Treatment of Triple Negative Breast Cancer and ER Positive HER2 Negative Breast Cancer. My name is Peter Schmidt. I work at Barts Hospital in London. It's my pleasure today to to welcome a fantastic faculty with Eva Cirelos on on, on stage from Madrid, Carlos Barrios, my dear friend from, from Brazil, and Hope Rugo, who will join us virtually from San Francisco. The agenda today is probably self-explanatory. Uh, who would have thought five years ago that we have a, a symposium talking about TROP2 targeting ADCs? But, but, but we really the purpose is to improve the, the understanding of TROP2 targeting ADCs, the rationale for their use in, in, in breast cancer, really discuss a little bit what, what the current role is for, the, for these drugs in, in, in triple negative breast cancer, but, but equally what the emerging role is in ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. But I think it would also be nice for us to discuss where we think this role will, will, will ultimately move to. And we also want to use this as an opportunity to, to exchange some practical considerations for how we integrate these antibody drug conjugates into our individualized treatment plans, how we manage side effects, how we sequence treatments in the best possible way. There will hopefully be plenty of time for Q&A, and we have two interesting case discussions, and then we will try to end on time. They can all uh, return to the rest of the, of the conference. Um, I would also, a- again, just point out that for this symposium, we have partnered with GRASP and, and, and Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and uh, again, can only encourage you to review and download this, this supplemental resource compendium uh, at, at the websites that, that are highlighted here. It's my pleasure now to actually start with the presentations. Uh, we are done with the introduction. So my role is to talk a little bit about the rationale of TROP2 targeting therapies in general, but also then in, in triple negative breast cancer. Now you're all familiar with the concept of antibody drug conjugates. Uh, for many years, we thought they're all relatively similar. They all have three components. They have an antibody, and that antibody targets some tumor-specific antigen. And in the past, we we were trying to target the oncogenic driver, but we can discuss that we're actually moving away from that. Then you have what you can see on this slide in red, this this, this cytotoxic drug. It's called the payload, and we used to say warhead, but that's a little bit too militaristic for most of us these these days. And in orange, orange, something called the linker, which is basically that glues this chemotherapy drug onto the antibody. And there are fundamental differences between different ADCs. And and you will have heard that ADCs targeting the same target using the same antibody can have dramatically different efficacy. And that is down to the linker and that is down to, to, to the payload. So it's really important to understand the biology of each ADC you're using. The original way we thought these ADCs work is, is, is illustrated here. We thought the ADC binds to the cancer cells, gets internalized, and then the, the, the antibody gets sort of broken off the chemotherapy drug, which diffuses back into the inside of the cell. But what we've learned is, is that in addition to this sort of conventional basic uh, mode of action, there's also a second and a probably equally important way these, these, these drugs work because we have learned that some of the cancer drugs can diffuse out of the cell again and therefore destroy some of the cancer cells that are just in the, in, 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 in the, in the near environment. We also have learned that some of those ADCs, if they bind to the surface of the cancer cell, can actually release the payload without being internalized. And that has really opened the field to getting much more effective drug. The effect this is describing is called the so-called bystand effect. And it's really important. If you think about you have one positive cell and you target that positive cell with the ADC, 
and the ADC only takes out that positive cell, but you have 10 negative cells for HER2 or TROP2, whatever your target is, the 10 negative cells are not affected unless you have a bystander effect. Now, with this next generation of ADCs, with the bystander effect, even if only one cell is positive, the other cells are negative around there. They will still be affected, and therefore we could increase the anti-tumor activity dramatically with this next generation of drugs. Now, my job is to talk about job 2 targeting agents in triple negative breast cancer. You're all aware triple negative breast cancer is a highly heterogeneous disease. There isn't one type of triple negative breast cancer. There have been attempts to classify triple negative breast cancer based by gene expression profiling, but that is probably not going to be the way forward. Where we're heading at the moment is classified triple negative breast cancer by treatment strategies. I'm not going to go through all those different groups, but clearly the antibody drug conjugates are playing an increasing role. And we have also learned that these different treatment strategies have either different target populations or different therapeutic targets. For ADCs, and that includes, uh, includes top two target ADCs, it is becoming increasingly clear we don't need to target the oncogenic driver. What does that mean? We don't need to target what actually drives the cell forward. All we need is to find a protein on the surface of the cancer cells that is there, but not on normal cells. And then we can bring the chemotherapy drug in through the antibody. We've also learned that these different treatment strategies and those targets are overlapping. In other words, you can be PD1 positive and a candidate for immune therapy, but at the same time you can have a BRCA germline mutation or high expression of TROP2 and be a candidate for, for, for that treatment. If you look briefly, just to put it into context, the management of triple negative breast cancer, I, I will assure you I'm not going to go into detail here, but we have made a dramatic move away from primary surgery to primary chemotherapy and more recently have incorporated the combination of chemotherapy and immune therapy as a standard of care for the majority of patients with stage 2 or stage 3 triple negative breast cancer, which allows us to divide patients into two groups. That's not my, uh, not my alarm clock here. Which allows us to, to divide patients into two groups, a group of patients who does fantastically well and has a complete pathological response, and those patients we can de-escalate therapies, and a group of patients who have residual disease where we give other additional therapy after surgery. In the metastatic setting, the standard has become over recent years from taxanes and platinum to, to chemotherapy and immune therapy, at least in patients with PDL1 positive disease. In the second and third line setting, it, it, it has taken us a little bit longer to improve standards, but what we've learned in the first line setting clearly was if we add chemotherapy if you add immune therapy to patients who have first-line chemotherapy, we can improve overall survival, we can improve progression of free survival substantially, but only in patients with pd one positive disease. And as a result, that is our current standard in the first-line setting. In the second-line setting, we tend to choose chemotherapy, or used to choose chemotherapy options that weren't used already. And sometimes we were already running out of very effective options in, in a third and subsequent line setting. So if you look at antibody drug conjugates in triple negative breast cancer, there's a number of targets we are exploring at the moment. And, and, and CHOP2 has become more or less the front runner in this setting. It's, it's expressed in more than 90% of triple negative breast cancers. We had very early on really encouraging data with Sakituzumab uh, that the first ADC uh, developed against, uh, against CHOP2. So humanized anti-CHOP2 antibody. It has as a payload uh, something called SN38, which is ultimately an, an arena TKN derivative. And, and, and again, as I mentioned the linker already, it's, it's, it can be hydrolyzed before the drug gets internalized. There's a high uh, drug antibody ratio. And therefore, we don't need to internalize the drug for, 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 for it to exert its bystander effect. Now, the first data we saw with Sagituzumab were in a, in a phase one trial. And there was a phase one trial in patients who had at least three prior lines of therapy. Now, for those of you who treat triple negative breast cancer, it's really difficult to still achieve an objective response in, in, in that disease setting. And when we saw these data here, and everything that, that, that if the vertical lines go, go downwards, it means the cancer actually shrunk. With those very early data, we saw a substantial efficacy in heavily pretreated patients, and many of them were on treatment for, for, for quite some time. If you look at the response rate, 33% in heavily pretreated patients, 45% had at least disease stabilization, eight months uh, duration of, of response. That was really important. The question we asked at that time, is 
this just patient selection? Because triple negative breast cancer is quite heterogeneous. And so what you see on the left side on the slide now is a really interesting uh, analysis from the same study. You see in red the time patients were on the previous treatment before they moved on to sagituzumab, and in blue the time patients spent on sagituzumab. And, and, and it's very obvious that the time on the sagituzumab, the later line, was much longer than the line time on, on, on the treatment before. But if you, for example, go down third patients from above two months on treatment before, more than two years on sagituzumab, so clearly a drug that can change the way we, we, this, this disease behaves. And therefore, we were expecting the phase three trial to confirm this. Phase three trial is called ASCENT trial. So going back to the polling question, it was a randomized trial between sacituzumab, CHOP2 targeting ADC, and patients who had received at least two prior lines of chemotherapy. One of them could have been in the early disease setting. And they were randomized against treatment of physician's choice. More than half of the patients had a ribolin. Alternative options were capecitabine, venorelbin, and gemcitabine. Primary endpoint progression-free survival, secondary endpoint overall survival. And if you look at the progression-free survival data, in an impressive, a meaningful, a statistically significant difference, hazard ratio 0.41. We see trebling of the median PFS from 1.7 to 5.6 months. And we saw the same benefit in patients who have brain metastasis as, as, as a pre-planned uh, subgroup. If you look at the overall survival data in this trial, again, we see doubling of overall survival, hazard ratio 0.48 from 6 to about 12 months. The third endpoint is has come slightly out of fashion, but I think it's really, really important for patients. That's, that's objective response. If you have a patient with symptoms, for example, lung metastasis leading to shortness of breath or cough, you will only improve those symptoms if the cancer actually shrinks. And if you look at the objective response rates with Sagituzuma, we see 35% compared to 5%, which unfortunately just confirmed how ineffective standard chemotherapy is in these late lines of therapy. If you look at these subgroups, does Sagituzuma provide the same benefit across different subgroups, or are there some patients who don't or benefit or benefit much more? The answer is practically all patients in that trial had a very, very similar benefit. I want to highlight two groups, which I think are important. One is if patients had already several lines of therapy, they had the same benefit if, uh, as, as if they received the treatment earlier. And the second is patients who started their journey as triple negative breast cancer, and, uh, as, as ear positive breast cancer, and then turned triple negative, still had the same benefit. We also try to see whether we see a benefit in, in, in selecting patients by CHOP2 expression. And you see in green the response rate of patients with sagituzumab in gray chemotherapy, and then the different uh, the different uh, groups of high, low, or intermediate CHOP2 expression. And the bottom line is, yes, you may respond a little bit better if you're high or intermediate CHOP2 expression, but ultimately, even in patients with low CHOP2 expression, they do better compared to standard chemotherapy in response rate, but also, as you see in the right bottom corner, in terms of overall survival, and that's probably down to the bystander effect I, I, I mentioned to you. So if you look at the overview of side effects in, in, in the ASCENT trial, you see uh, two-thirds of patients had neutropenia, but that's generally uh, fa fairly well manageable. Uh, and the, the neutropenia, uh, fair power neutropenia rate was relatively low. You see that about 60% had, had diarrhea. Uh, but again, we've learned over recent years how to manage diarrhea well, and I, I look forward to discussing this with you in, in more detail. There's a second ADC data DXD that's currently in, in, in development. And again, similar structure as a job 2 target antibody, as a top poi summarize uh, payload, and has a cleavable linker. Uh, and, and, and I'm not going, it's difficult to compare one ADC with the other, of, uh, but, but, but it has the same basic principle of what I would call a next generation antibody drug conjugate. Now, Data DXD, as the short form is, was, was tested in a in sort of in a several tumor entity trial called a Tropion uh, a Pan Tumor or One trial. And there was a code of, uh, in there for patients with triple negative breast cancer. There's also a code with ear positive uh, patients, and, and Hope Ruger will talk about this in a minute. Now, if you just look at the response data of this trial, again, patients with triple negative breast cancer, most of them substantially pretreated, so it's difficult to achieve responses. The 5% response with chemotherapy, just, just as a benchmark here. And we saw the responses were 34%, and in patients who did not have prior sagituzumab, it was 52%. Now, I want to 
highlight two things here. You see in, in blue, that's all patients, but then you see in orange, uh, patients classified in orange and patients classified in yellow. The patients in orange are patients who had prior treatment with sacituzumab. So that's an antibody drug conjugate targeting exactly the same target. And as you can see, some patients benefit, other patients don't benefit, but it is possible to sequentially treat, uh, the, treat the same target. In yellow, you see patients who had the same payload before by, by, by getting a different antibody drug conjugate. Again, one responded, one didn't respond. And that raises a question, and Carlos will, will, will pack up on this later on, on resistance to antibody drug conjugate. Is this resistance to the target or to the payload? I also want to very briefly mention the safety profile, which is very different to the safety profile of sacituzumab. And that just highlights it's not just, the pay, not just the target that defines the safety profile, but also the interaction with the payload. For example, with data DXD, we see more mucosal toxicity, more stomatitis. We also see some keratitis, and we're working out strategies how to optimally manage that. Now, this is in the... This is, it needs to be seen in the context of other ADCs being developed. This is the whole range of promising agents coming through at the moment, where we will learn over time how best to, 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 to use them, them, them clinically. A final point to make is also, can we combine antibody drug conjugates? And we have intriguing early data from, from combination studies, one with data DXD plus Devolumab from the, from the Begonia trial first line, unselected patient with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Most of these patients were PD-1 negative. So that's interesting because we have an immune therapy combination. And three out of four patients responded, and the responses seem to be fairly durable. So that's a really powerful signal, and I look forward to, 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 to doing additional work to, to work this out. So where are we with the management of TMBC now in 2022? We clearly have sacituzumab as a new standard of care in a second and third line setting. We also have with TDXD uh, and HER2 targeting ADC coming through as an emerging standard of care in patients with HER2 low disease. But, 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 but the question is, is really where are we heading with some of those open research questions? What is the role of antibody drug conjugates, immune therapy combinations, especially in patients who may have had immune therapy before. How do we best sequence those ADCs? And again, that's something I would like to discuss with you. If you look at the current indications where sacituzumab is highlighted, it's a little bit uh, to, to, to make it easier. But we are clearly at the moment also looking into moving those ADCs into a first-line setting. Ascendo 3 is a, is, 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 is a randomized trial. Um, there's Tropion 2 again in the public domain, a trial with data DXD in the very same setting. There's a trial, a phase 3 trial, Ascendo 4, happening using uh, sacituzumab in combination with immune therapy. Uh, uh, and you can imagine that this will probably be matched by the other ADC at some point as well. In the early disease setting, we're really, really optimistic these drugs will change the way we treat is in the post neo setting where we already have at least one of those ADCs there. And you, I'm sure you will see additional ADCs there. And we're working on strategies to incorporate this into the neo treatment setting. This is where we are with drop 2 targeting agents in, in triple negative breast cancer. It's now my pleasure to introduce again Hope Rigo, who's professor of medicine at, in, in, in San Francisco, and unfortunately can't be here face to face, but she will be joining us early in the morning in San Francisco uh, virtually. Hope is there to talk about the, the emerging role of drop 2 targeting ADCs in ear positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Hope, over to you. I hope the internet works. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. Great talk and uh, fun to hear uh, that discussion and where we're going in the future as well. So, of course, hormone receptor positive breast cancer is a key area for us to uh, look at here. So the most common subset of breast cancer that we see uh, representing about 70% of breast cancers in the metastatic as well as early stage setting. And we've made dramatic advances. We've improved survival by adding targeted agents to endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibitors. We have new therapies targeting the PI3 kinase pathway and actually a brand new therapy with a press release in the last few weeks, Capiva Sertib, an AKT inhibitor, improving progression-free survival and new endocrine agents with oral surrogates where there is a glimmer of hope for another strategy for targeting the hormone receptor. Now, after patients develop 
resistance to endocrine therapy after sequential endocrine therapies with targeted agents. The only options have been sequential single agent chemotherapy, but cumulative toxicity as well as resistance over time has limited options. And our standard has been shorter uh, durations of response as well as lower response rates as we go sequentially to different agents. Um, and then the availability of therapies that are effective and tolerable in the late line setting has been quite limited. But now we have antibody drug conjugates, and this has, in the last uh, less than a year, completely changed the options for patients with metastatic endocrine resistant hormone receptor positive breast cancer, as you saw earlier in the very nice talk by Peter. Uh, that we can deliver toxins directly to the tumor cell, but not just to the tumor cell that's targeted, but also to the surrounding cells. And for some of these agents, not all, we've seen less cumulative toxicity. And that's an important point because the current ADCs, which are in the clinic, um, don't have cumulative, for example, uh, neuropathy, the non-HER2 uh, indications, the uh, trastuzumab, emtansine, uh, TDM1 does have some cumulative neuropathy, but it's generally reversible. But these other agents don't, and that's been a major issue that limited, limits therapy in the metastatic setting for our patients. So you heard about sasituzumab govitecan, a first-in-class trope 2 directed ADC, and in this next generation a group of antibody drug conjugates, there is in general a high drug to antibody ratio here, 7.6 to 1. But what's interesting is that uh, the efficacy of these ADCs seems to be dependent on all the different parts of the ADC. So it's not just the high drug to antibody ratio, as you heard about datapotamab durextacan, uh, the next uh, trope 2 ADC that's being evaluated in phase three trials has actually a lower drug to antibody ratio, about half that of sasituzumab. So it does depend on both the, uh, all three aspects, the antibody that delivers the toxin, the drug to antibody ratio, and the toxin itself, as well as the linker, uh, which is a complicated biology. So in the first analysis of sasituzumab govitecan, there was the now very popular umbrella trial where the drug was tested in a number of different advanced malignancies. And one of these groups was hormone receptor positive HER2 negative endocrine resistant metastatic breast cancer, where 54 patients were treated with sasituzumab and had a median prior line of chemotherapy for metastatic disease of two. There was an impressive response rate of 31%, almost a 50% uh, clinical benefit rate, and then a progression survival of 5.5 months with an overall survival of 12 months. And you can see this waterfall plot here. Uh, so that led to interest in studying sasituzumab and hormone receptor positive disease, particularly after we saw the success you just heard outlined by Peter in triple negative disease. So that led to the development of Tropix 2 And this trial was uh, really designed to be similar to ASCENT, uh, in other words, to study patients who already had received multiple lines of prior therapy. Eligible patients had locally determined hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, and all patients had to have received at least one endocrine therapy, a taxane, and a CDK4-6 inhibitor in any setting. So it's one of the trials where all patients had to have had progressive disease after a CDK4-6 inhibitor that we know alters to some degree responses to subsequent endocrine therapies at least. They also had to have received at least two, but not more than four lines of prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Um, and patients who relapsed very early after their adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy, that would count as one line. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive thacetizumab or chemotherapy of physician choice, and this is a standard array of chemotherapy options, CAPE, venerelbine, gemcitabine, or iribulin. A total of 543 patients were uh, randomized, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival by a blinded independent group and the standard secondary endpoints, and we'll talk about the statistics uh, here. Uh, this was a uh, now, again, more popular than in the past higher hierarchical and uh, statistical uh, design. So patient, the first endpoint, of course, is progression-free survival. 
if you had a statistically significant benefit in progression-free survival, you could look at overall survival and three interim analyses. Well, three uh, analyses were planned, two interim and a final analysis. But because we reached statistical significance with overall survival at the second interim analysis, that will be the last formal analysis of survival. And then, of course, you have to have significance in overall survival before you can look at overall response and significance in response before you can look at global health status, quality of life. Uh, this uh, We presented the second uh, planned interim analysis of overall survival at ESMO after presenting the primary analysis of progression-free survival at ASCO, now published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And there was a big difference in the number of events from the first to second survival analysis. We had almost 100 additional uh, survival events, and the median duration of follow-up was 12.5 months um, at the time of this analysis. So uh, 543 patients were randomized, and a question has come up about why were so many patients screened, but of course, in uh, some countries that enrolled patients, uh, they hadn't done uh, central, they hadn't done even local HER2 testing. Um, also, many of these patients had additional uh, tumors found, for example, brain metastases, et cetera, or abnormal liver function tests on their screening, so then weren't eligible. At the time of this analysis, nine patients remained on sasetuzumab and two on treatment of physician choice. So what did patients get for treatment of physician choice? They actually had to have uh, the, the treating physicians had to select the treatment of physician choice before patients were randomized. Uh, but in the final analysis in the TPC arm, almost 50% of patients received aribulin, as you would expect in this later line group of patients, because uh, most had received capecitabine, only 22 received capecitabine, and the other two large groups were venerelbine and gemcitabine. Most patients stopped therapy due to progressive disease. This was a heavily pretreated patient population. The median number of prior lines of chemotherapy was three. Uh, patients were a median of about four years from diagnosis of metastatic disease until uh, treatment on study. And then everybody had to have had a CDK4-6 inhibitor and about 40% received a CDK4-6 inhibitor for more than 12 months. 95% of patients in this trial had visceral metastases, uh, really indicating how far out patients were from their therapy in the metastatic setting. Um, as you can see here, and almost 90%, 85 to 90% had liver metastases. So progression-free survival was significantly prolonged with the use of sasetuzumab compared to treatment of physician choice. The hazard ratio is 0.66, and the statistical design uh, was aiming at a hazard ratio of 0.7. This was highly significant, 0.003. Uh, but you can see that quite a lot of patients progressed uh, before the first scan here. So this is at the first or second scan, and it was relatively similar. These are patients with very resistant disease to any form of therapy. So because that does change the difference median, which was 1.5 months, we looked at landmark time points and at all landmarks, six, nine, and 12 months, there were more patients alive and free from progression who received acetizumab than treatment of physician choice. And notably, 12 months, three times as many patients were alive and free from progression in the acetizumab arm. Uh, we also looked, as presented by our colleague Marme uh, at uh, ESMO uh, this year, at whether or not it made a difference uh, based on her too low expression. And uh, this was really based on the fact that uh, we've seen remarkable results with trastuzumab drugstican in her too low disease. It's important to keep in mind that that is a trastuzumab uh, based antibody drug conjugate. But there was interest to understand uh, whether or not there could be a difference in the late line setting between the HER2 low and HER2 zero groups. Uh, so this shows you the patients who are HER2 zero and then HER2 HER2 zero in the middle, um, HER2 negative and intent to treat. Now different from the Destiny Breast 4 trial that looked at TDXD or trastuzumab drugstican, this was determined locally and not centrally. And as you can see, there was benefit from sasetuzumab that existed across the different HER2 subsets with no real difference uh, based on HER2 status, as we would have expected. So what we uh, presented at ESMO uh, and present some updates at San Antonio was the second interim analysis of overall survival. Here you can see there is a significant improvement in overall survival with treatment with sasetuzumab versus treatment of physician choice. 
with a median overall survival of 11.2 versus 14.4 months, so a difference of three two months, hazard ratio 0.79, and a p-value of 0 0.02. Uh, and then these uh, landmark analyses, I think are sometimes helpful for thinking about how we're benefiting our patients. 47% of patients were alive at 12 months who received treatment of physician choice versus 16% who received sasetizumab. Because we were able to look at uh, overall survival, uh, we were able to look at uh, responses. Uh, and you can see here that uh, responses were uh, higher in patients who received sasetizumab. The overall response rate went from 14 to 21% with an odds ratio of 1.63. We could look at significance because the overall survival was significantly improved and the p-value was 0 0.035. In addition, clinical benefit rate was significantly improved. There was a longer median duration of response. Uh, and then because response was improved, we were able to look at quality of life endpoints and specifically global health status and quality of life. Uh, there was a significantly longer time delay in deterioration in global health status quality of life in patients who receive sasetizumab uh, going from uh, three to 4.3 months, hazard ratio 0.75, again, statistically significant. There's also a, a decrease in fatigue uh, and no difference in pain. So this is also a really important endpoint and additional details on quality of life uh, were presented by my colleague Aditya Bardia at ESMO as well, uh, but uh, show uh, similar endpoints. In terms of safety, you know, we had really looked at the safety in quite great detail in the ascent trial, and there were no new safety signals. Again, the most common uh, uh, toxicity was a neutropenia and uh, less commonly diarrhea with about a 9% rate of grade three diarrhea. Uh, and uh, we saw that uh, one patient died of a neutropenic-like complication in the sasetizumab arm, this patient had uh, neutropenic colitis and developed septic shock. And I think that highlights the importance, as it does for any chemotherapy that we administer for patients, in understanding the complex relationship between mucosal toxicity and neutropenia. So patients who have mucosal toxicity um, should be treated aggressively for neutropenia, and neutropenia increases the risks of mucosal toxicity. So uh, in that uh, tropic so two showed that sasetizumab and progression-free survival and received an extensive and homogeneous uh, group of their treatments, endocrine therapy, chemo, and prior CDK4-6 inhibitors with a medium of three lines of prior chemotherapy. And now we've also shown that there's an improvement in overall survival with a median improvement of 3.2 months, an improvement in response, and a delay in time deterioration in overall health-related quality of life, as well as in fatigue, and new safety signals, which is also, I think, very encouraging in this, again, heavily pretreated patient population. So as uh, Peter mentioned, there's a lot of interest in looking at combinations of antibody drug conjugates. Uh, there is uh, interest in the interaction between uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other agents that impact the immune system and antibody drug conjugates. And this shows you a nice cartoon published this year about the uh, potential mechanism where uh, you cause immunogenic cell death by internalization of the antibody drug conjugate into the cancer cell, but then that releases a lot of inflammatory uh, uh, factors that stimulate the maturation of various immune cells within the host um, so that that could then enhance the host immune response, allowing checkpoint inhibitors to be more effective. So if ADCs activate the immune system through this effect, as well as through ADCC, uh, you would expect that the combination of ADCs and immunotherapy might be even more effective. There are a number of studies looking at the combination of antibody drug conjugates and immunotherapy. Uh, and here you can see this, uh, which is really a pilot study uh, but in a fairly large number of patients, 110 patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, and less heavily treated, just zero to one prior chemotherapies, these patients are being randomized to sasetizumab, govitecan, and pembrolizumab versus sasetizumab primary endpoint of PFS, that study is being run out of Dana-Farber. And you saw this get trial, which also looks at patients with high-risk hormone receptor positive disease in post-neo setting that's being conducted by the German breast group. 
and they heard about Apotimab Deruxtecan, uh, and there is a, a later line study that looked at Apotimab Deruxtecan and Dervalimab um, in uh, too low uh, metastatic breast cancers, heavily treated 15 patients at hormone receptor positive disease. The overall response rate was 50% with a PFS of seven months. Fascinating that this is a low drug to antibody ratio, four to one, but it causes a new toxicity, stomatitis, that's not seen with TXD, or even with the other uh, Deruxtecan ADC, uh, the antibody against ter patritumab Deruxtecan. Um, they still see interstitial lung disease, and maybe that we can control the stomatitis with a sterile mouthwash, and we're looking at that in the Neoadjuvant ISPY2 trial. So there is an ongoing study, Tropion Breast 01, that is looking at apotimab drastican versus investigator choice of chemotherapy in patients who've received the two prior lines of chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Uh, they don't have to have had a prior CDK46 inhibitor. This trial actually has already completed accrual in the United States, but is continuing to accrue patients in Asia and Europe. Uh, and the NCN guidelines were rapidly uh, updated after. ASCO this year, within two weeks, probably the fastest update uh, almost ever, uh, where now we have recommendations for patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 low disease with TDXD and for more heavily pretreated hormone receptor positive metastatic disease uh, with sasotizumab gobatecan, and that's outlined here. And then uh, we saw in uh, October of this year, in, in uh, September, the uh, Gilead submitted uh, for reviews in hormone receptor positive to negative breast cancer. And just on October 11th, the USFT accepted uh, this application for priority review and the uh, PADUVA dated in February of 2023. So we could hear from uh, this review earlier than February, but that's the last date that we'll hear from the uh, assessment of the FDA about uh, Sasachismab Govitecan. But priority review indicates this is considered an important analysis. So uh, antibody drug conjugates have clearly changed our approach to chemotherapy. They effectively deliver toxins to the cancer cell, but they are still chemotherapy, and we'll talk with the cases about management of toxicity. We should still follow the guideline approach with sequential endocrine therapy with targeted agents, and hopefully we'll be able to consider sastuzumab in the third line or later in patients with hormone receptor positive disease. We don't understand the sequencing uh, of antibody drug conjugates and activity and whether the toxin or target or both is most important in sequential efficacy. And a number of studies will look at this as well as real world analyses. And the role of immunotherapy remains to be defined. But at present, if we had the drug available to us, uh, we could give sequential endocrine therapy with targeted agents uh, followed by using antibody drug conjugate either uh, individually in HER2-0 sasitumab her too low TDFD, um, or sequentially, as we'll look about and look for in the future. Uh, thanks very much. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Carlos Barrios. We have two really interesting cases prepared. Carlos will lead to the first case and even then to the second one. Thank you, Peter. The idea here is to try to bring all this data into clinical practice. And uh, probably in the next uh, few slides, I'll be presenting a case that you are familiar with and that you probably seeing in your practice uh, on a weekly basis. This is a young 37-year-old uh, patient that presented with a 3-centimeter triple negative breast cancer. She had uh, initially a hormone receptor negative, HER2-1+. She had a clinically positive axillan, whereas uh, BRCA uh, negative. She was treated with the standard treatment, the Keynote 522 regimen. And uh, she had, unfortunately, residual disease that surgery with an RCB of three and three positive axillary lymph nodes after that, uh, quote unquote, ideal uh, treatment. We know this happens to some of our patients, and probably you have patients with that situation in your practice uh, on a weekly basis. She received, after that, adjuvant treatment with radiation therapy, pembrolizumab, and caesidabine. And 11 months after completion of her pembrolizumab, she presented with fatigue and some mild cough, just very minimal symptoms. And on imaging, she was found to have lung and liver metastasis. A liver biopsy was confirmed in her triple negative disease, hormone receptor negative by immunohistochemistry. And here she had a HER2-0 
instead of the HER2-1 plus she had before. And a PDL one test, CPS, showed more than 10, a positive PDL one testing at that point. She had at, uh, clinically a PS of zero and no other comorbidities. Very quickly, would you have a specific idea on what to do in this kind of patient? Yeah, for this patient, um, you know, the recurrence was 11 months after finishing Pembro. So, you know, sort of within a year of treatment with curative intent, she's received one line of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. So in this setting, we would use sasetizumab as the next line therapy based on the U.S. FDA approval and the improvement in overall survival. And I think that would be fairly standard. I think, you know, Peter brings up an important point. She received neoadjuvant and adjuvant pembrolizumab. If the patient had pd one positive disease, we would have given Pembro with the first line therapy, probably depending on the time from her exposure to taxane, either with the taxane or gem carbo, but we'd still use sasetizumab in the second line setting. Okay, so you see that uh, even the experts, uh, we are not necessarily sure of what the best alternative are. We need clinical trials that uh, actually tells us if sasetizumab potentially it's a better drug in this situation. Obviously, the re-exposure to uh, immunotherapy is something that we need to study better. So what happens? Can we continue? The patient received first-line chemotherapy with aribulin, like a standard treatment that you probably would uh, uh, consider in your clinical practice. She had, a, as a best response, stable disease, another very common situation in that uh, uh, treatment, with progression after th only three months. I see that sasituzumab is a clear indication here, as this, this patient is, could have been included in accent trial, so I would vote in favor of SASI. And uh, regarding trastuzumab terustecan, as the last biopsy has lost the one plus expression for her too, I would be guided based on the last biopsy, so SASI would be my preferred option. So uh, uh, what happened with this patient? This patient was treated with sasituzumab. She had a fantastic response uh, with a very good partial response in all her liver and lung lesions. However, as you would expect, in a short period of time, eight months, she developed uh, brain metastasis, which is something that we all have patients in this kind of situation. So the, the idea of this case is to reflect reflect things that happen to you in everyday practice. Uh, while her disease systemically was well controlled, okay? So in this situation, I will leave it open to you because we don't have data in that kind of uh, uh, setting. Are you going to do uh, radiation therapy? Are you going to continue with sasituzumab? Okay, we don't have enough experience in that kind of situation. It tells us there is a right thing to do or not. Okay, clinical trials in this scenario is what I would uh, essentially encourage all of you to consider. The last message I would like to leave you before I uh, pass the, the podium to, to Eva uh, is uh, this very interesting paper I would like you to uh, address. We need to study better the, re the res resistant mechanisms. Okay, and as was mentioned briefly by Peter earlier, the resistant mechanisms to ADCs probably are multifactorial. You can consider resistance to the antibody because the antigen may not be there. You may consider resistance to the toxic payload because the cell develops resistance as it develops resistance to any chemotherapy. And in this case, you see a patient that actually <laughs> developed both types of resistance in the same situation in different metastases. Some metastases actually developed a mutation that actually made the drug uh, not effective anymore uh, uh, attacking the DNA, the, drop, uh, the top two one mutation. Uh, and the, at the same time, there was a mutation in the gene encoding for the TROP2 uh, uh, molecule that misplaced the TROP2 from the, uh, the membrane, and actually the antibody was not able to uh, 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 be effective anymore. So telling us how complicated this can be and how much uh, effort we need to put in order to learn the resistant mechanisms, because this is going to be critical in how we're going to be able to sequence these drugs, as <laughs> Hope was mentioning. And with that, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll pass it to Eva, that will present another case. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos.
Thank you, Carlos, Peter. Hello, everyone. So let's go into the ER positive, her to negative space. So I had a 63-year-old postmenopausal woman without any other comorbidities. That was, uh, and she was diagnosed many years ago in Egypt, in El Cairo, uh, with a left breast carcinoma. It was a stage PT2N2 luminal B, her to negative. And received adjuvant chemotherapy in that uh, center with AC, the four cycles, a standard dose uh, paclitaxel, non weekly paclitaxel, and external radiotherapy. Adjuvant amoxifen was administered during five years. This could be changed now uh, due to aromatase inhibitors and extended adjuvant hormonal treatment. <coughs> Maybe because of that, or why? Uh, she uh, had a relapse uh, eight years after in bone and liver. No biopsy was done to confirm uh, this metastasis, so no molecular assays, no immunostochemistry. So based on luminal phenotype from diagnosis, they treated uh, her with 88 cycles in the first-line setting and uh, achieving a partial response, and afterwards uh, she was maintained with an astrosol. So it was done in a different center eight years ago. Two years after, and while on maintenance with an astrosol treatment, she developed a progressive disease in the liver, and again, any biopsies done. Uh, second line, palbocyclic plus fulvestrum was offered to the patient and uh, radiotherapy in some bone lesions. So this is the summary of our patient. So maybe this could have been changed uh, nowadays. Um, two years after uh, fulvestrum plus palbocyclic, she again developed liver progressive disease. In this case, we had uh, news from a uh, liver biopsy. She still has a uh, high uh, expression on ER, 80%, 30% expression on PR, Chi-67, 60%, and one plus for HER2 positivity, no amplification for HER2. So this is the last biopsy, the last molecular information that we have, and they offer treatment with third-line capecitabine for this patient. So... Um, this is not exactly as recommended now as we do recommend first-line endocrine treatment in combination with CDK for six inhibitors. So things have been changing during the last decade. We do recommend to have performed peak PCA status to offer alpelisif or other uh, developing uh, peak PCA inhibitors in the first or second line, depending on approvals. And we do recommend to test for or BRC1 or 2 status to consider as well PARP inhibitors. After all these uh, combinations, uh, chemotherapy should be maintained uh, when endocrine resistance is acquired. So with our patients, uh, she um, had again a liver progressive disease and bone disease. She moved to Madrid and I visited her at that date, January 2020. And we uh, performed the garden uh, assay, and we diagnosed of a mutation, patholog pathogenic mutations in big 3 ca So uh, in our patient, we had access to Tropion 2 trial. So she was included in the trial, and <clears throat> she was randomized to, to erm a that means acetuzumab gobiteca and standard dose. So she started treatment with this drug in January 2020. So you've uh, been uh, able to see and review with Dr. Rugostock uh, the impact in progression free survival, primary endpoint, and in overall survival as well, key secondary endpoint. So this patient was uh, treated with this drug and a state on partial response in liver and bone as well during two years. So this is a very, very good responder, exceptional responder with a very long uh, control of disease. She just had developed grade one asthenia, grade one diarrhea, so no need for those reductions, no dose interruptions. So this is a very nice case to show the 
impact, not just statistically speaking in terms of clinical trials, but the benefit that this particular patient acquired uh, to this drug. So uh, two years later, she uh, developed liver progressive disease, so we initiated treatment with Eriboli. So our, our patient needs more options. She's on ECOG zero. She is ready to have uh, the next line, and we have two possible biomarkers here to be treated. Her too low disease, we are in the fourth line setting, Maybe trastuzumab, the rustecan, is a good option, but still she has a pathogenic mutation on PIK3CA. Uh, maybe it's too late to offer alpelisib with an endocrine treatment because this is fourth line. I would love to know your opinions, Peter. Yeah, interesting question. Um, I personally would steer probably to another ADC. Uh, I would give trastuzumab, the rustecan, if it's accessible. Um, you mentioned change in HER2 expression, but I think if our experience, if they were positive at some point, then they have a good chance of deriving a benefit. Uh, comparing the chances of responding to TDXD compared to a PF3 kinase inhibitor, I think are substantially higher. If you look at the TOX profile, funnily enough, one is classified as ADC in chemotherapy, the other was classified as targeted therapy. But actually, the TOX profile, I would also personally prefer TDXD. I would like to, 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 to thank speakers, Hope uh, virtually, Eva, Carlos, for, for coming here, joining us today. Uh, I think it was a really interesting program. would like to, to, to thank peer view and, and, and the team, really, for, for setting the scene, for helping us to develop this program, uh, and for the sponsors to, to, to make it possible. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ZDH860. This program has been supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partners, GRASP and Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.